All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the UC SEREP Racial Equity and Extension webinar series. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. I'm also here with Sonia Brote of the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, who will be telling us a little bit more about this webinar series, and Clint Zhu, who will be running our polls and troubleshooting any technical problems. Uh, before we get started, I want to cover a few important details for this webinar. You won't be able to use your microphone during the webinar. If you have questions for any of the panelists or if you have any technical problems during the webinar, please use the Q&A option, which is located in the Zoom navigation bar. We will also use the chat feature to share any links to resources or, at, um, or any organizations that are mentioned. Uh, there will be some poll questions during this webinar that will appear as pop-up windows. Some browsers may block these polls from appearing. We will add a link to the chat to help you manage pop-ups in case this is an issue for you. Restarting the webinar may also help, but we cannot guarantee that this will fix all problems. You may also feel free to submit your answers to the panelists through the chat feature if you're not able to see the polls or respond to them. Live automated captions are being provided for this webinar. If you do not wish to see these, you can switch them off by clicking the CC live caption uh, live transcript in the Zoom uh, navigation bar and selecting hide captions. We are recording this webinar, so you'll be able to go back and listen to any part of it if you wish to do so. The recording will be made available on the UCANR YouTube channel. Near the end of the webinar, we will provide a link to a feedback survey that you can use to let us know what went well and what can be improved. And by participating today, your, your contact information will be added to an email list that we'll use to advertise upcoming webinars. You can opt out of these emails if you do not wish to receive them. Okay, so before we get into the content, I wanna pass the mic over to Sonia for a minute, who will tell us a little bit more about the Racial Equity and Extension webinar series, and, uh, and then we'll start our panel discussion. So Sonia. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, so I'm Sonia Broad, and I'm the Deputy Director of the UC Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, and I'd really like to welcome everyone to the first in our series of webinars on achieving racial equity in agricultural and food systems extension work. And I'd most especially like to thank our three panelists for making time to talk with us today. I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program of USDA for professional development funding for this series. So people have sometimes asked, what does engaging with farm workers have to do with sustainable agriculture? So let me just briefly address that by way of framing our session today. So here at UC Sarup, we tend to focus on all three pillars of sustainability. So that includes economic viability, environmental health, and also social equity. So today's focus on engaging farm workers in extension work is an important matter of social equity directly relating to human dignity and community well-being. And I'd also like to pose that it also intersects closely with both economic and environmental sustainability. As most of you probably know, we have very labor intensive crop and livestock systems here in California. And so if we are interested in implementation of sustainability practices on the farm, it would probably behoove us to consider all of the individuals on a farm who are responsible for implementing these practices. And in fact, along these lines, um, our former colleague Sasha Capps conducted a needs assessment for this racial equity work uh, for us a couple of years back. And she found in talking to people that often when farm workers are asked what kind of jobs they do, they often respond that they are farmers. So today we'd like to acknowledge and honor all the farm workers and the important farmer and farming roles that they fulfill on our farms and in our communities. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Stephanie and then to our panelists, thank you. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Um, so before we get started, we have a few poll questions that we want to launch um, just to get an idea of who's participating today. Uh, the first two poll questions are what is your job and where do you do most of your work? Um, and to see the second poll question, make sure you scroll down because uh, it's a little bit further down in the, in the uh, window there. And if you can't see 
the poll question for any reason, feel free to submit your answer in the chat directly to the panelists. All right. Okay, so we have a, a lot of people from Cooperative Extension, advisors, specialists, some university researchers, nonprofit and community-based staff, and some people from NRCS and other government agencies and some other jobs as well. And feel free to add your job to the chat if it's not listed here. Um, and where do you do most of your work? Oh, there's a lot of people from Northern California on this. You're welcome. And, uh, and we also have some people from Central California and Southern California. It's good to, good to have you here. Uh, next two poll questions. So these next two poll questions are how frequently do you work with farm workers as clientele? And what are the greatest challenges you face in serving farm workers? Okay, so we have a decent number of people who work with farm workers a little bit, some who haven't at all. Um, and then we have some who work with farm workers uh, more than half the time and or all of the time. So that's also good to see. Um, and then what are the greatest challenges you face? Looks like our challenges are across the board. And if you have any, any other challenges that, that aren't listed, if you answered other, feel free to add those to the chat as well. Okay, so thank you all. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the panel discussion. Thank you so much for answering those. Um, our panelists today are Dr. Bonnie Bade, Professor, uh, Professor of Anthropology at California State University, San Marcos. Patricia Carrillo, Executive Director of the Agriculture Land-Based Training Association, or ALBA. And Christy Getz, Assistant Cooperative Extension Specialist at UC Berkeley. Okay, so let's get started. Our first question is, uh, tell us about your work and how you engage with the farm workers of California. Um, and Patricia, would you like to start? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Patricia Carrillo. I'm the executive director of, as, of Alba, as Stephanie mentioned. Um, we are an organic farm incubator based in Salinas, California. Um, and uh, basically, we are training farm workers to become farm owners to make that transition. Uh, we have a one year long educational program and a four year incubator program. Um, and during the time that um, that um, participants are in the incubator, the goal is really to help them establish themselves and grow so that they're able to transition off successfully and continue to operate their own organic uh, farm businesses. Bonnie, do you wanna go next? Sure, hi everyone. My name's Bonnie Bade. I've been working with farm workers throughout California since the late 1980s. I, uh, my dissertation was based on field research that I did in Madera, California with uh, migrant indigenous communities from Oaxaca uh, who are con constituting increasingly, you know, over the years, um, the labor force. Um, in uh, the late 1990s, I was uh, contracted by the California Institute for Rural Studies, which was up at Davis at the time, to be the co-principal investigator of the first ever statewide study of farm worker health. That was done. We did, um, we interviewed over nearly a thousand farm workers throughout the state. And we also performed um, physical exams on more than nearly 700 farm workers. And this is throughout the state in every agricultural region from the Imperial Valley to the Central Valley, the Sacramento Valley, Salinas Valley, um, and uh, of course, uh, two sites in, in the Central Valley and then also in Southern California um, that also has a large agricultural um, economy. Uh, then uh, as a professor, I've been working, I work with a lot of students who are uh, the children of farm workers and my work has continued to um, work with local farm workers. And so I've been actively engaged working with um, farm workers and particularly community-based organizations of farm workers, indigenous farm workers, such as the Binational Indigenous Organization and um, other uh, community-based organizations throughout the state. All right, Christy, feel free to jump in. Sure, sorry to unmute myself. So yeah, so my name is Christy Getz and I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist at UC Berkeley. 
Um, I've been in this position for almost 20 years, which is kind of hard to believe sometimes. Um, one of my program areas has been broadly looking at farm labor issues in California agriculture. Um, my position 20 years ago when advertised was a significant shift away from sort of the way Cooperative Extension had traditionally conceptualized its positions um, around labor, which historically was more in the realm of ag personnel management. So it was sort of like, how can, how can growers manage their workforce? So my position was really quite a shift from that approach. Um, and it was, it was a result of affirmative action, an affirmative action mandate to um, approach farm labor issues from the perspective of workers themselves. Um, and at the time, 20 years ago, it was hard to find other collaborators within Cooperative Extension. Um, although there were a few, I worked in the beginning with Gail Feenstra of Syrup, and I continue to work with her. Um, but at that point, I really looked to try to collaborate and build upon strengths and connections of external collaborators, external to um, UC A&R and UC Cooperative Extension for both um, research and extension related work. Um, and I think 20 years later, we're really at a turning point. Um, there's sort of a new generation of extension academics who are more critically examining the history of the Langray University um, and who, who is its clientele and how do we determine who our clientele is? I don't love the word clientele, but that's kind of the term we use. Um, so basically, I've really, my approach has been sort of leveraging the strengths of the university, but really collaborating with other groups and other folks who are more embedded in local networks of farm worker and farm worker communities. Um, so I was just going to show a quick slide, very, very quick of sort of some of the highlights of projects I've worked on um, over the last 20 years. Just I just highlighted four. So here I'm going to just share this real quick. Um, there we go. Okay. So just and we can, you know, if people want to know more about these, we can get back to this later. But um, early in my career, I collaborated with the California Institute for Rural Studies and a variety of local partners in Fresno um, to conduct a farm worker food security assessment. Um, and we came out with a report called Hunger in the Fields. And not surprisingly, we found, you know, quite high levels of, of, of food insecurity among the farm worker population. We also developed, um, we produced a Spanish language telenovela. Um, called La Flor del Sin Nombre, which was um, an outreach project funded by the California Department of Public Health, and it addressed um, nutrition education themes relevant to farm workers, as well as it highlighted sort of structural causes of food insecurity um, that many farm workers face. Um, and then throughout the last 20 years, in various ways, I've really done research on the synergies and tensions between the farm labor movement and the sustainable ag movement. And I've collaborated with UC Syrup on this and the United Farm Workers Union. Um, Gail Feenster, Amy Shrek, and I conducted the first survey of organic growers regarding labor practices in California. And um, we have also published some of our qualitative research. Um, and then in the last 10 years, and including up till now, I've been doing research on the um, on social certification in agriculture and um, evaluated both the Equitable Food Initiative and Fair Trade USA. And then I'm currently involved with UC Merced on a follow-up study 20 years later to the study that Bonnie was a co-PI on 20 years ago, looking at farm worker health. And that includes a survey of 1500 farm workers in California. And then the part that the role I'm playing with my colleague Ron Strolik of the Nutrition Policy Institute is doing in-depth interviews with growers and other stakeholders um, around issues relating to farm worker access to health care. So um, anyway, that's just some highlights from my program and happy to talk more about any of this, any of these later. So, okay, so great. Awkward. Thank you. You're welcome. Our, our second question is, why is addressing farm workers needs critical to protecting the sustainability of our food system? And Christy, would you like to start that question? Sure. And feel free for after after she answers, like, feel free to jump in. You, I don't have to like, tell you who to talk next. Yeah, and I don't want to I, I, I don't want to take away what Bonnie's going to say because she's I think you're I think Bonnie, you're going to talk about the COVID-19 farm worker study. But I was just going to start by saying that I think that really could the COVID pandemic has demonstrated this so so vis vividly and I hope we can leverage on some of the momentum um, from what we've learned over the last you know year and a half with the COVID pandemic and it. And I would you know, I love my Angelou's quote that it, it is it's if the chain is, as, how did it say, if the chain is, is only as strong as its weakest link, um, isn't it also true that a society is only as healthy as its sickest citizen and only as wealthy as its most deprived? So just to quote Maya Angelou there. Um, and I do really think that the pandemic exposed how essential agriculture workers really are. Um, and the vulnerability of a food system that is based on really 
designed to be dangerous and designed to be built on the back of our most vulnerable um, people in our food system. So um, I hope that we can leverage those lessons. Um, you know, farm workers during COVID got finally got some paid sick leave. There was free testing, there was free vaccinations. I mean, these are the kinds of services that should be universal all of the time. Um, you know, and how do we address these needs? I mean, I think that's one of the things I've spent a lot of my career thinking about, which is, you know, there's policy interventions, there's enforcement, there's an epidemic of under enforcement of a lot of regulations in agriculture. There's really um, like, we should be enforcing our heat stress um, laws, um, the, the sexual harassment trainings that are now mandatory. Um, and then there's other ways and there's the role of the private sector, some of the supply chain driven um, initiatives. I think one of the most well known is the Coalition for Mockley Workers, which has um, really put pressure on um, the fast food industry to make sure that farm workers are getting fair pay and fair and decent working conditions. Um, so at any rate, I think that I think that it's been really made very visible that farm workers are incredibly critical to um, our food system and um, important members of our society. So maybe maybe Bonnie, you could go into a little more depth on this. <laughs> I also just wanted to add before I got onto that that um, UC Cooperative Extension holds a sweet spot in my heart. Um, I was my my initial research with uh, farm workers back in 1987 started with um, UC Cooperative funding of a really mini study in Madera, California on farm worker health. So I worked very closely with uh, UC Cooperative um, extension employees in uh, Madera County, as well as Kern County in that area. So um, back at UC Riverside, I also work closely with the uh, UC Cooperative Extension. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, that was my main intent for uh, participating in today's seminar was because I really do see a great role for UC Cooperative Extension to play in the lives and well-being of farm workers. I don't need to remind this audience that uh, California's agricultural system is a $50 billion a year industry and that uh, we employ upwards of 800,000 workers. And um, the majority of those workers are foreign born and a large percentage of those workers are undocumented. And so this is a workforce that is um, very insecure and very vulnerable to many economic and political forces surrounding them. Um, I uh, think that, um, you know, lack of access to health care, uh, working in extreme and dangerous conditions of exposure, very difficult labor. Um, the job insecurity is rarely mentioned, but this is huge. We know that uh, many farm workers will have more than 18 jobs a year. And so knowing, you know, job security is a, a an important source of stress for farm worker families. Um, but also what we noticed um, during the study that uh, Christy mentioned, this was uh, again, uh, uh, another study that I was involved with the California Institute for Rural Studies. It's, um, it was a COVID farm worker study. You can, uh, I'll, I'll post the uh, website for you if you'd like to see some of the materials that have resulted from that. But we started in March of 2020 and we interviewed uh, over a thousand workers throughout the state. And um, we work closely with um, community-based organizations who work intimately with farm workers. And we really got some very eye-opening um, information. Um, mostly about how existing um, conditions of unhealthful living conditions and dangerous working conditions uh, uh, in um, no access to safety net um, programs and exclusion from protections and other things that really were exacerbated during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, we found that many farm workers lost wages, lost work. Um, the whole issue of homeschooling created a massive problem among the farm workers throughout the state uh, regarding access to appropriate uh, internet tools and broadband, uh, etc. Um, 
but the uh, food insecurity and healthcare barriers, these are all um, longstanding problems among farm workers. And uh, it would be really great to see um, the UC Cooperative Extension um, step up its role in acting as liaison and support and uh, providing uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate educational materials for farm workers. And I'll pass it on to Christy. Uh, I, I'd like to hear from Patricia. On I'm this in real Patricia. Quick. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Patricia. <laughs> I do have a question, though. I see some questions in the QA. I don't yes. know if it's being we, sent directly to me or. <laughs> Um, so I will read them. I think what we'll do is after you answer this question, I'll read one more of the questions that we have planned and then we'll go to the to the Q&A because there's actually quite a few questions there. I was gonna, yeah, so. I was going to say, and I feel like answering at least the can you define who is a farm worker and do you work with plant-based agriculture, animal agriculture, or a mix of both would probably be great. I, I oh, guess sure. In the context of the conversation, but, oh, yeah, but I can, I guess I can, I can chime in on the, on the question and then we can figure it out. I, I just, I don't know. I, I was looking at those going, well, it's a little bit, you know, important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I think, yeah, definitely, as Christine and Bonnie said, um, we, or, you know, not we necessarily because we know this, but, you know, many people have now realized that, that farm workers are essential, um, even though, um, you know, the degree to which, you um, Things have, have um, gotten better. Um, in some cases, I feel hasn't been a, hasn't been a lot. There, ha, you know, um, just being honest, um, it, uh, there hasn't been a lot, and um, and you know, it's it's hard to imagine, or it's hard for me to imagine that you know some of these protections that were temporarily put in place are going to continue um, after you know COVID is is gone or whatever we're we're calling it and now that we have reopened. Um, but yeah, in general, I just feel that um, it's important to to try to take care of the farm workers and the and the workforce because um, we have uh, a large agriculture industry. We're feeding the nation, and people don't have access to healthcare. People don't have um, um, like safe living spaces. There's you know you see the homeless numbers, right? Because homelessness is is defined as even. Um, sharing uh, bedrooms, but you see that the houses and, and just kind of the numbers, the general numbers and how people are living, it's just uh, heartbreaking and it affects so many different areas. It affects um, children and, and nutrition and, you know, access to access to food and um, just concentration levels, I feel, in general in school grades. If you're living in a house that's just, uh, you know, a, a two bedroom house and there's 20 or maybe 30 people living in there. I mean, recently we saw uh, a case here in Salinas where they found a house, um, a, you know, like a three bedroom and it had bunk beds in there. And I think they had over 80 or 90 people living uh, there and probably mostly farm workers. Um, um, and, you know, it's just a, re a really important thing uh, that we can ignore. And uh, there's just so much interconnectedness in, in it all. And, um, and um, you know, now we're facing labor shortages um, and we're having to bring in uh, a lot more um, guest workers um, just because, um, because of so many of these things, right? COVID and housing, housing being so expensive, no access to, to any of these things that I mentioned, healthcare or um, as, as Bonnie was saying, um, yeah, there's jobs, but there isn't job security. So people have to move around. And they're going to other to other states. A lot of people go to Arizona or other areas, um, and um, yeah, we see that, and we fail to recognize that there needs to be some some protections, and um, we end up not not having enough people to actually do the work. I think Sonia had a follow up question, and then I want to get to the Q and A so we can answer um, yeah some of the questions from our audience. Good idea, thanks. Um, I just wanted to follow up Bonnie and maybe also Christy, especially. Um, you were saying you see a great role for cooperative extension to engage more with farm workers. And I'm wondering, do you feel that that means there needs to be other types of advisors and specialists added 
Or what about also like on this webinar today, it seems we have quite a few NRCS folks on and also a lot of the advisors in Cooperative Extension have expertise more in like natural resources and crop production and irrigation. So I guess the question is, do you see a role for those types of advisors in engaging with farm advisors or do you feel it's really incumbent upon the bigger institutions to add more different expertise to the roles? Well, that's a big question. I, yeah. I will say that I recently participated in a conference with uh, Cal OSHA and we had a lot of farm workers uh, who were there. And, um, you know, the process by which a farm worker can report a complaint, a, a labor violation in the field is very prohibitive. It's not linguistically or culturally appropriate. Um, oftentimes they don't get calls back. They don't get, the, nobody calls them back. Um, so, you know, we have these really, we have great regulations in place and we have enforcement uh, entities in place. However, just something doesn't seem to follow through. And um, I see a really great role for Cooperative Extension to act as a liaison to some of these existing entities that already are out there, including the Agricultural Labor Relations Board or Cal OSHA and um, you know, that National Farm Worker Institute, et cetera, the um, Cooperative Extension is, has been, you know, focused on crop production and farmers. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at nearly a million farm workers in the state, then it, you know, it definitely farm workers as essential workers play such an important role in our food systems and the, and the, the fluid, you know, the fluid running of our, of our food system. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the staffing and the description, the job descriptions within UC Cooperative Extension, but, you know, I do know that there are county wide individuals, you know, even at the county level, it would be really great to see um, individuals utilize their expertise to, um, I mean, nobody's talking to farm labor contractors. And I saw that somebody asked a question about that, you know, far, um, because of uh, a numerous political and historical factors, you know, it's not growers who are hiring farm workers, it's farm labor contractors. And um, that's where a lot of the violations take place. And it's very difficult to um, uh, get farm work, labor contractors even access to farm labor contractors is very difficult because there are these labor violations and, uh, you know, passing, uh, the, the, going around the rules and the regulations. And so they're really not eager to um, have researchers out there in the fields or, um, you know, interviewing people in labor camps. So that kind of stuff you sort of have to run around and do um, on the side. So I feel like uh, UC Cooperative Extension that, that there's the there's just a big void between the reality in which farm workers live, the actual rules and entities that exist, such as labor laws, and then um, cooperative extension and and you know there's just a big giant um, gap between what UC Cooperative Extension is doing and the reality in which farm workers are living. And I'm very eager, because I know that UC Cooperative Extension has a history of being very interested in the well-being of farm workers, but I don't know if it's a structural issue or, or a job description issue where it just simply always seems to be under the radar or under the, under the job description of what the cooperative extension does. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. Bonnie, you bring up really great points. And I, I, there's so many, there's so many aspects to this. I mean, there's definitely structural issues. Um, I think cooperative extension is embedded in its longstanding relationship with growers and grower organizations that do advocate for funding and at the um, state level. And I think those are, um, those priorities are hard to break. Um, and I also think that, you know, this idea that we're going to look to our existing cooperative extension advisors to sort of, I mean, there's, a, interestingly, there is quite right now, we're seeing a lot more interest from advisors to, to do work on farm labor issues, but 
you know, our advisors are already stretched incredibly thin. And I really believe we need leadership from the top um, in terms of sort of what is, what are our job descriptions gonna look like? How are we gonna allocate our, our FTE? And we really, this really needs to come from the top and from, um, it just needs to be a priority. And I think, you know, a couple years ago, we did um, add a new outcome measure, measurement, which was um, improving the lives of our farm and food workers. So that is now a way we can evaluate our programs, which is exciting. That's a new thing. Um, and over the last, just even over the last two years, we have an increase in advisors who are um, reporting that they are doing work on that. So there is a little bit of positive momentum. And I think that um, the interest is there, but I do believe we need sort of the larger um, UC a &R to really prioritize this issue. Um, yeah, and I also agree with you, Bonnie, that like there is a real potential for a cooperative extension to play that liaison role in a variety of ways that we just haven't, we haven't had the bandwidth to do and it would be great to move in that direction. Patricia, do you wanna to speak to this or should I move on to the Q and A? You can move on to the Q and A, I think. Um, okay, okay. So um, you mentioned that there's a there's a question here that we can expand on. Can you define who is a farm worker, and do you work with plant based agriculture, animal agriculture, or a mix of both? Uh, well, with the California Institute for Rural Studies, we recently had a long conversation about you know what is a farm worker and who should we include in this great in this gigantic study that we just did, and we um, decided that we were going to include uh, workers who are picking, processing, and packing, um, as well as caring for the plants. But we also um, included uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, excuse me, um, animal husbandry. And so uh, packers and um, workers pro in, in meat processing plants um, as well. So, um, you know, it, it's one of those fluid definitions. It depends on who's asking and what's their intent. Um, Patricia, maybe you have something else to say about that. There we go, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Yeah, you. my screen is stuck. So hopefully you guys are okay on your end. It's yeah. not working for me. Okay, uh -oh. I, I guess it'll eventually catch up. Um, yeah, so who are farm workers? Um, so are the farmer, farm workers that we work with are primarily um, immigrant farm workers who are um, working in the tri-county region. So Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito areas. Um, and they are... Um, you know, getting their their working low low paying jobs, um, and um, you know harvesting and and packing um, produce in in our community. And um, we primarily, well, we're an organic farm and it's only uh, plant based, so it's only a produce uh, for our farmers. But you know, some of the alumni, once they graduate off of the farm, they do a hybrid of um, of um, you know, growing plants and also growing, or you know, having like chickens and selling eggs or um, or um, meat and such. Yeah, I'll just chime in. I mean, I guess I would agree that, like, for me, it's it's a it's it just depends on the context. And most of my personal work has been looking at issues in the plant based sector, and I've actually just started exploring some of the labor issues in um, the cannabis industry, which is. Um, definitely a piece of California agriculture that is um, shifting rapidly and um, the labor force around that is shifting as well. So um, something to keep in mind when we think about farm labor. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to another question from the audience. There's so many. Um, so there, we have one for Patricia. How has the process looked for graduates of ALBA's incubator program going from incubator to owner what is the success rate? How many graduates are still farming two, three, four years later? And what are the bi biggest challenges to success of those graduates? And how can the UC or nonprofit system better support these efforts? That's a lot in that question. So let me know if you want me to repeat any of it. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Okay. Wait, I just pulled it up. <laughs> I just pulled that up. 
remember what I'm supposed to respond to. Um, so how has the process looked? Um, so typically uh, when farm, farmers are in the incubator, um, they start out on ha about half an acre of land and they're growing each year that they're in the incubator. Um, obviously depending on how well they're doing and how their production is going and how much land they can manage. Um, um, in about their third or fourth year, um, most of them will start getting land outside of the incubator. So we try to connect them with uh, FarmLink and kitchen table advisors, like Coke Farms, like some of our partners uh, for these land needs and also to be able to um, help them review contracts and make sure that the land is going to work for them. Um, you know, unfortunately, just because of the, the um, lack of really available land um, and kind of um, the way that that land is, is, is owned and, and, and controlled um, in, in the area, um, there aren't a lot of opportunities for them to purchase uh, land. And, and in some cases when they do purchase land, um, or when they have purchased land, it hasn't necessarily worked out for them because there's a lot of issues. Um, you know, they bought, they bought lands in hopes of um, being able to farm and then they don't have an irrigation system. Um, you know, maybe the soil is inappropriate and they try to work with our local um, NRCS office, our Natural Res Resource and Conservation Services um, Department to, um, to get some of those conservation projects going and to get um, the irrigation system set up and, you know, it hasn't always worked out for the most part. Um, so yeah, so they're typically leasing and they're typically leasing, you know, an average of 10 to 12 acres, uh, though we do have, you know, a couple of superstars that are operating on more than 130 acres now. Um, what is the success rate? Sorry, I'm pulling up the question here. So we've had um, over 400 participants graduate from the PEPA program and of those parts, and, it, and it's sort of like a funnel, right? We come, we come into the incubator or they come into the class and there's about 40 participants and then they start trickling down. We kind of see it as a business planning process, right? It's a year long course and you're learning all about organic farming uh, and what it takes to actually run your business. Um, and about 20 to 25 of those will graduate and about 12 of those will, um, will ask for land in the incubator. Um, so at the end of the, the four years, uh, we have about five graduates. In, in the past, we've had about five people who, who successfully go, go off and, and start farming. Though I have to say in, um, in the past four years or so, we've seen numbers rise and demand has, has really risen. And um, right now, uh, with because of COVID, we had to switch our uh, our PEPA course, the farmer education program um, um, online. And we've been doing everything online. And uh, in one of the modules, we had about 80 participants. And not only um, not only local participants, we had some uh, participants from out of the country. So we had a student from Chile. Uh, we have student participants from out of the state. Um, and, you know, so it's it's been, it's been a good thing for us. You know, I think we've grown, the farmers have grown. We've been able to teach them how to use technology and the, the staff has also grown in how their use of technology um, and just making all of that work. Um, but we've also been able to, I guess, um, um, respond to some of them that demand because we've always had requests for online courses and we haven't had the capacity to, to do it. And now we were just forced to do it. Um, so, um, I think going forward, we probably want to do a hybrid of that, but obviously the, the missing piece um, that's critical is the, the farm, the farm operation. And we hadn't had, um, or had, hadn't been able to have uh, the students go out and actually practice until a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Saturdays ago was our first class and, and um, they were able to go out and plant. Um, so what are the biggest challenges um, I don't do I skip something. Um, access to land. Access to land is, is the biggest challenge. Um, access to, to capital in some cases, though we do have partners that, that are working with the farmers. Um, but um, you know, it's it's hard um, even when there is there are loan programs, you still need um, money for a down payment on a property, uh, which is which is hard. It's hard for a farmer. They have cash flow um, needs. They have to invest a lot into their operation. 
and um, and um, you know try to build wealth at the same time so that they can actually make a purchase. Um, and um, just the regulations, the changing regulations, the growing regulations, they're extremely burdensome on, on small farmers. Um, so obviously during the time that they're Alba, uh, Alba, we're helping them on a daily basis with all of these regulations, complying with food safety policies, complying with CCOF organic certification uh, rules, uh, CDFA, all of those things that they need to comply with. And then all of a sudden they're out on their own. Um, so what we've been able to do um, this year is just expand some of those services and actually start working with alumni and reconnect with alumni that have been out of the incubator for a while and provide some of these services because, uh, you know, it's expensive. It's really expensive. Um, if you are trying to get a food safety certificate on your own, you end up paying close to $5,000. Um, you need to have, you you know, a, a lot of the farmers have language barriers um, and, you um, you know, obviously technology um, might not be able to um, to do a great job on the paperwork. So right now we're having our um, staff, our, our um, compliance staff go out and help them set up their food safety funds and prepare them for an audit so that they're only paying for the auditor to come out and actually do inspections. Um, so that saves on about half of the cost for that. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, really, it's just access to capital to continue moving forward. And then the, the the land piece, which is always extremely difficult. And, you know, they might get a piece of land somewhere and it's not suitable for the crops that they were used to growing. So that means that they're, you know, redoing their entire crop plan and um, might have to find a whole other market for it or might just have to adapt um, or might end up um, looking for another piece of land. And, and those that find very small pieces do end up leasing, um, you know, two or three pieces to try to, to have enough um, land so that they're able to um, really um, sustain their, themselves from it. Because, you know, their whole point is to try to, um, to make it be su sustainable and to live off of their farm. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we have another question. I'm trying to prioritize these, but this is a little tricky. Um, so we have a question from Catherine. Can you share any thoughts or experience on whether certificates for trainings would be valuable to farm workers and if or how that's been successful in the past with organizations you've worked with or know of? Um, and then just some additional comments to that. As I think about expanding my extension offerings to farm workers, I wonder how to make those trainings not just something farm workers learn from, but something they may be able to commoditize, earn more, et cetera. Anyone can start this question. I can add this to well, the chat as well. I feel like I just, I just spoke, but yeah, no, definitely. And that's something, um, that's something that I didn't go into when, when uh, we started, but um, besides the organic incubator, which is primarily what we do, we also focus on uh, workforce development. Um, because as I said, um, you know, only a handful of students that go through the PEPA course are actually coming into the incubator. Um, and a lot of them just come in and um, either go through PEPA or enter, you know, a year or two of the incubator, and then they go back into the labor force and get better, higher paying jobs within agriculture. Um, a lot of the farmers will, um, especially the younger ones um, who are not going to college, um, have gone back to college and gotten degrees in agricultural sciences. And like now we have one farmer who uh, came in at 18 um, and wasn't going to school, but he was, uh, you know, he was really supporting his family just based based on the production he had at Alba and then uh, transitioned and expanded, uh, expanded and then eventually transitioned off. And he paid for his education, uh, his college education uh, with the, the farm proceeds. And now he's a pest control advisor. And he is just amazing, um, just watching kind of that growth. So, you know, I've been with Alba for about 12 years. Um, I took like a four year break. So you could say I started at Alba 16 years ago. So, you know, watching, um, watching um, some, some of these farmers and the kids of farmers as well, um, who have been part of um, these farm families and who are now, you know, graduating from college also with um, ag science um, degrees. And, um, you know, we just, um, had one one of um, 
the former's um, daughters who invited me to speak on a different panel, um, kind of same topic, which is really interesting. Um, who I met when she was about six years old. Um, now she graduated and now she's working at, um, what is it, Snow City Farms, and she's trying to connect us with them so that they can replicate something like what we do. Um, so yeah, definitely for certificates, we, we try to do that. We try to, um, you know, talk to, um, to other folks in the industry and see what they need. We piloted some programs uh, with um, like some of our local neighbors with Mitsui Farms. And, um, you know, we, um, we've been um, contracted to do some trainings for them on leadership development um, for a lot of, of the people who they see potential in uh, but don't necessarily have a training for like for supervisory skills. So we've done that. Uh, we've also done like, uh, uh, what is it? Basic and advanced uh, berry horticulture and they get certificates. And a lot of the, a lot of the um, ag employers want them to be able to get a certificate quickly in there. And so we'll do like eight or nine week courses. And um, it's not only, um, it's not only the, the ag employers, but also like Cardinal College who is looking for that for their students. So we're doing um, like summer, summer trainings for students. And uh, we're also now talking to Rancho Cielo about possibly doing something for their students um, that would allow them to get these certificate courses and hopefully get some entry level jobs in agriculture. Uh, but yeah, definitely the goal is to try to get them some, some certificates that they can use um, that prove that they have these skills. And, and we had, we've had some of those, some of the farmers in our program leave and um, even become um, labor contractors because now they understand what's required um, and they know that labor is important and they know how to manage that because they've already been, been farming for, for a few years. Oh, that's so interesting, Patricia. I think it's really exciting, you know, this whole idea of getting farm workers to become farmers. I think it's really wonderful. Um, my experience throughout California with farm workers, however, uh, that's a very small percentage of farm workers out there. Um, the kinds of certificates that you're talking about are really valuable for people who are going to be growers and, and, and you know, uh, as you said, supervisors and things like this. But I think, uh, you know, um, certificates, you know, this question of certificate, well, a certificate in what, you know, um, for, for your uh, average farm worker who is working a piece rate system, um, what kind of certificate would be valuable for that person? Well, one thing I could say um, that I think would be useful is that um, as a result of that uh, statewide study that we did that was published by the California Institute for Rural Studies and the California Endowment, it's called Suffering in Silence. And, well, part of the result of that was um, that the California Endowment then pledged um, $50 million a year for five years straight to address farm worker health. And that resulted in all kinds of programs throughout the state by you know, local clinics, et cetera. And one of the things that really came out of that was the rise of the promotoras. And promotoras are community members who are farm workers as well, who are maybe bilingual or trilingual. And they live in farm worker communities, whether it's at labor camps on Indian reservations in San Diego County, or whether it is um, you know, um, out in um, uh, makeshift labor camps in the Imperial Valley, which are circles of trailers where people live, um, the promotoras then can gain a training on basic healthcare. And um, they work in liaison with local community clinics and then they do health education. So health education training on things like breast cancer screening or, or cancer screening in general, or um, uh, oral hygiene. We found that uh, many, many farm workers have never been to the dentist ever. And, um, and that dental health is a huge issue among farm workers. And so um, uh, the promotoras have uh, really begun to play uh, since the 2000, play an increasingly important role in farm worker communities as liaisons 
uh, to the community. And um, one of the biggest barriers I think for outsiders is that um, you know farm workers are living in a really vulnerable state of being. Many are undocumented and uh, live in constant fear. And so trust is a huge issue in the farm worker community. Um, a big white, you know, gabacha like me walking out into a labor camp and trying to talk to farm workers without ever having any previous contact would be really frightening for most farm workers. And so um, uh, the work, I'm, I'm answering some of the questions that I've seen in, in this chat as well in the Q&A. Um, you know, it's very important then for us outsiders to work closely with community-based organizations who are daily and intimately working with farm workers to um, achieve enough trust to be able to approach the farm worker community and begin to work with them. And the promotoras are a sort of another liaison. I could easily see the, universe, the UC Cooperative Extension liaisoning with local community clinics local community-based organizations and promotora networks with whom um, these other two entities work daily to be able to implement, um, you know, an education campaign, a campaign, uh, a certificate campaign. So a certificate in, uh, in a promotora for a promotora would be very, very useful or certificates in, um, you know, the labor laws, what are the labor laws? And how do you know that your um, the labor laws are being violated in the workplace um, when you really don't have a voice or maybe you don't know what the rules are. You don't know that you were supposed to have a break. You don't know that there's supposed to be more than one bathroom. You don't know that there's supposed to be water in the field. You know, so we have these really incredible rules, but enforcement of those rules um, is, uh, limited for numerous reasons. One, of course, is lack of personnel. You know, for the Central Valley alone, very few individuals are out there working um, to enforce labor laws. And so it, the farm workers themselves find themselves in a position where they're the ones that are noting and experiencing violation of labor laws and, and um, sexual harassment in the workplace and other kinds of uh, violations, and they don't know where to go. <laughs> and um, as I was mentioning earlier, like for example, you go to Cal OSHA, somebody in the, in the Q&A mentioned the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, which is also a really awesome entity, but its scope is so limited. The worker has actually got to you know, go out and, and seek the Agricultural Labor Relations Board office and and try to communicate to them what happened. And oftentimes that office is limited to being able to only to address issues of retaliation in the workforce. You know, so if you complain about a labor law and then you get fired, then the ALRB can kick in and, and support you. And so a lot of times the, uh, you know, the question of certificates, I think, can be framed in generating um, farm worker advocates within the community, whether they be promotoras or labor relations and, and labor law, ind individuals who are trained in that, who belong to the farm labor force themselves and can act as liaisons to these larger entities like Cooperative Extension, like Agricultural Labor Relations Board. Christy, you're nodding your head. So I think yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think, I think one of the issues is like, for example, CAT is a tree for its advisor. And so like, you know, to the extent that, like, how can she use her skill set on behalf of farm workers? And it sounds like that there's a needs assessment going on to kind of explore that. But I think the kind of thing you're discuss, you're talking about, Bonnie, this is where we could really use some brand new positions <laughs> to um, kind of facilitate that work. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that there's a lot of potential for how we could play that role. Um, I mean, there's so much I could say about that, but I, I really just do agree with everything you said. And um, again, I feel like this is a question of bandwidth and priorities of how our institution is allocating its resources. Well, one of the things that really struck us in the um, COFS study, the, the COVID-19 farm workers study that we did with the California Institute for Rural Studies was this tremendous role that local community-based organizations are playing. 
So for example, if I could share my screen with you for just one second here, I'd like to show you um, some work that uh, I discovered in Los Angeles. So when COVID-19 came out, um, you know, who was telling farm workers uh, about masking, about PPE, about washing hands? And it, you know, there wasn't a state or county or federal entity who was doing this in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. Um, it simply wasn't happening. And so we found, for example, I'm on the website of mycielo.org. And one of the things that they did, if you could see this, is so mycielo.org um, pro produced COVID-19 prevention educational materials in Zapotec, Mixtec, Conjobal, Maya Quiche Maya, um, Acateco, and literally dozens and dozens of indigenous languages that we know are represented in the agricultural labor force from California, Oregon, and Washington. And so um, furthermore, we had um, the, co the community-based organizations out um, providing drive-through food service because food insecurity was such a huge issue during COVID-19. We had community-based organizations providing PPE, sewing and making masks and providing those to farm workers. And, and what was just so astounding to me was, you know, where are, where are the federal entities? Where are the health department entities? Where are the, the county entities that should be active in this? That simply were, there was just silence. And so um, I think for, um, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, I think that for UC Cooperative Extension, there's just such an exciting, um, frontier that needs to be occupied by an official entity that has such prestige and clout as the UC Cooperative Extension um, in, in agriculture that could really step up and say, okay, we're going to begin to play a larger role. I, I think educational materials is one of the largest and most important Important, culturally and linguistically appropriate educational materials. A huge role that UC Cooperative Extension could be playing um, regarding that because there's just such a need. People don't know where to go. Farm workers don't know where to go. Even for healthcare, you know, transportation barriers, language barriers, you know, uh, lack of insurance. Um, and then when it comes to labor and labor laws, again, folks don't know what the rules are. They don't know where to go. They don't know to whom to report. And on to layer that with the vulnerability of being undocumented um, in the most recent um, you know, climate of anti-immigration climate, this has been a huge challenge. Thank you all. Um, kind of... Uh Coming off of that, uh, there's another question here that asks, um, we are developing a group focused on developing extension for groups who may be unable to access extension due to language barriers or other things. We are looking for insight on how to go about this and groups to speak to. Who should we reach out to? And you might've touched on this to some degree, but if you feel the need to expand. I, I, um, I would reach out to the California Institute for Rural Studies because of the, this massive study that we did. It was actually a tri-state study, California, Oregon, and Washington. We uh, mobilized uh, with uh, numerous community-based organizations throughout the state. So um, in order to do the, the study, in um, like the Imperial Valley, we had to work with local community-based organizations there who we found were very active and already way ahead of the game in terms of providing educational materials and PPE for farm workers. And, and the same goes for the Salinas Valley, the Central Valley, Sacramento Valley, Napa Valley, 
um, places like Oxnard and in Southern California. You know, in Southern California, we worked with uh, the Farm Worker Care Coalition, which is a co coalition of over 40 different organizations who work closely with farm workers. And so because we were connected to, the, to those community-based organizations, we were right on the pulse of what um, farm workers were experiencing on a daily basis. Um, you know, uh, for example, we interviewed in, in, cent in Central California, we started interviewing people in August. And by the time we got to November, some of those people had already died of COVID. And, um, you know, the community-based organizations were involved in helping people transport bodies back to Mexico and, um, you know, provide funeral services and, and funding for those kinds of things. And so um, I would be very happy to work with anybody who's interested. It would take too much time now to list all of those, but um, the California Institute for Rural Studies does have an existing list of community-based organizations throughout the state who are very eager to work with um, uh, larger entities like UC Cooperative Extension to be able to, um, you know, access uh, a, a larger audience of farm workers. Yeah, I would second that. I've been collaborating with California Institute for uh, Rural Studies for 20 years now in various ways, and um, they're a wonderful organization. And really, they were the only um, nonprofit focused solely on farm worker doing so farm worker research. Um, and it's just a great organization. Um, I do want to make a shout out to Susana Matias, who's a cooperative extension specialist in the nutrition department at UC Berkeley. And she has been part of the study that um, Bonnie Bate is a part of. And so um, she's another great contact. Um, and I'm, I'd certainly um, have collaborated with a variety of CBOs as well. I'd be happy to support as well. But I agree, CRS is a wonderful, wonderful organization. Any more comments on uh, who to reach out to or should I move on to the next? Okay. Um, all right, so the next question I have in the, in the Q&A here is, um, oh, let me see. So this question is for all. Um, with your work, how involved are you with policy slash immigration advocacy and where do your organizations stand on the following three bills introduced in hopes of addressing citizenship slash opportunity for undocumented farm workers? And those three bills are uh, Citizenship for Essential Workers Act, U.S. Citizenship Act, and Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Well, I'll just chime in that UC Cooperation is supposed to be neutral. Of course, we know that's nobody's ever neutral as we just look at our priorities or whatever but um so we have so cooperative extension has not taken an official position on any of those although um you know we there are those of us who do research that informs this kind of policy and i certainly have you know the um farm workforce modernization act there's a number of groups who come out in support of it including the united farm workers union farm worker justice but then there's other groups who are saying it's not going far enough and so you know it really just I'll let, I'll let our um, other two chime in, but um, yeah, so we don't take an official position as an organization. I can take a roundabout approach to that. Um, one of the things that we noticed during uh, the farm worker study, uh, COVID farm worker study, was we did not include H2A workers but we became aware of a lot of problems surrounding the H2A program. Um, a lot of abuses such as um, no work breaks or unpaid wages, confiscated passports, unpaid transportation, inadequate housing, um, excessive hours of work, just to name a few. And um, furthermore, um, a lot of small growers and uh, organic growers in California are, are not in favor of the HR 5038. I'm not sure which one of those bills that, that is. Um, <clears throat> but um, 
they're not in favor of it because it depends so heavily upon the H2A and it's being viewed as, okay, let's just make H2A the, the standard. And H2A is really problematic. Um, uh, small farmers, for example, have difficult, they can't participate in the program because of expenses, housing, the housing requirement being the primary expense for them that is prohibitive. Um, you know, and so, uh, these different bills, we certainly do need um, uh, a path to legalization of our workers, definitely. Um, but it seems uh, that some of the bills that are um, up right now are um, kind of glossing over or ignoring some of the real issues, including, um, uh, you know, food safety, access to health care. Um, insurance, uh, these kinds of things. Perhaps Patricia has more to say. Um, no, I mean, I agree with what both of you said and obviously we can't um, lobby either, right? Or take a, take a stance since we are a nonprofit organization. Um, so yeah, but there definitely needs to be something um, done this. I mean, we, we all know, I think that um, we have a broken immigration system. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of the the farm workers, if they don't come um, with um, with um, a visa, um, you know, it'll probably be very impossible, close to impossible for them to ever be able to achieve um, some kind of permanent status in the United States um, if they're using, you know, they come here they Well, another problem with the act is that, um, it requires that one is able to prove that they've worked for 100 days per, per year in agriculture for over nine years and that they're going to continue this for the, another eight years. And the average age of farm workers in California is 40. And so the, the very makeup of that uh, requirement is going to exclude a, a lot of workers aren't going to be able to work another eight years, 100 days a year. To, to achieve that. So um, that is also a concern among farm workers. Yeah, so just for those who aren't familiar with the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, it's, it's passed the House. Um, it's very questionable whether it'll pass the Senate, but basically the main trade-off that people are arguing about is it would allow a path to citizenship, as Bonnie said, for certain farm workers who've been here and can prove they've been working in, in farm labor for a certain amount of time. But then the trade-off is that it would loosen the H-2A restrictions and in, it would allow more H-2A workers in, which the H-2A program is, as Bonnie said, ripe with abuses and very problematic. And so, so the reason a lot far, some farm worker organizations are for it is because they really wanna see that path to citizenship. And then some are against it saying it's not worth expanding the H-2A program. So that's, it, I think that's kind of one of the main debates around it at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask a question that we had planned to ask because I think it's important, but I don't want to. I don't want to go too far away from the Q and A. But I know that uh, one way that you know extension professionals might try to reach farm worker communities and provide resources for farm workers is by you know creating resources in Spanish. Um, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on that, um, and what else should be done to. I mean, I think you've kind of addressed this already, but if you want to expand on Spanish uh, resources and how they're, how effective are they? Well, one thing about Spanish resources is that it's kind of the way they're presented. You know, um, farm workers seem to have allergies to eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper that just have text, 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 text. Um, my experience is that they don't read them, no matter what they are. And um, one thing that Lead It is Campesinas and other folks have realized is that one of the best ways to communicate with farm workers about whatever the topic is, is through what we call, uh, you know, through graphics, through graphics. And so as you were seeing in the video that I showed earlier, the use of graphics to explain what's going on. Um, and also, uh, I'm losing track of the question now, what was the exact question? But I wanted to show 
uh, again, to share the screen to show you um, an example that uh, is very effective um, in the use of graphics. So, you know, we launched a, a, a and by the way, a lot of farm workers on social media, tons of farm workers on Facebook, on Twitter, and on um, Instagram. So we launched an Instagram um, campaign at Christmas time, sort of uh, the 12, we called the 12 days of Christmas. And this turned out to be exceedingly um useful and powerful in the farm worker community, the use of graphics to, um, to communicate. So even though th I had, I didn't pull up the one in Spanish, we did it in Spanish and in English, but even when things are in Spanish, the way that they're presented uh, is, um, you know, Lideres Campesinas does a lot of skits. So for example, uh, theater skits on sexual harassment in the workplace or theater skits on, on uh, labor laws have been really, really useful uh, way of communicating um, sort of the graphic novel, the, the comic book, um, you know, in, in medicine, we call it graphic medicine, where you generate like a comic book to educate about, you know, um, AIDS or um, cancer prevention screening and these kinds of things, very, very powerful tools of communication versus just having things in Spanish. And then the other thing, I, of course, I've already mentioned is that, it, you know, we've got at least 25% or more of the farm workers in California speaking indigenous languages. So Spanish is the second language. And many people don't read or write furthermore. And so the importance of graphics is even increasingly, you know, that much more important because of um, the, uh, you know, re uh, the average education according to the latest study that we did um, is fourth grade. And so fourth grade, the average ed education of farm workers. So, uh, you know, even though folks can read and write, uh, comprehending really complex materials is often, uh, you know, much better communicated um, verbally. And so another way that, that, that uh, we've been and that community-based organizations get the word out to farm workers is by utilizing um, uh, forces like the Radio Bilingue, which is right there in the Central Valley. Radio Bilingue has emisoras all the way down into Mexico and up into Canada. And so when you, you know, broadcast something on Radio Bilingue, you're really getting to a huge, huge audience of farm workers and local um, Spanish speaking radio stations. But what's cool about Radio Bilingue is that they also, it's, it's really Radio Multilingue because they have programs in Zapotec and in Mixtec and Triqui and many other indigenous languages. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all of that. I think that, um, you know, exactly, Spanish language materials are not enough. It's, if we, you know, if, if Cooperative Center is developing Spanish language materials, hopefully it's a collaboration with a local organization or, um, you know, local cooperative extension offices and um, really partnering to get those materials out there. Because it's one thing to develop the materials, it's another thing, how are they going to get out there? And so like when we did, when um, I worked with uh, California Institute for Rural Studies on developing um, the Spanish language telenovela. We also developed a photo novela and then we collaborated with groups all over the state and those were the groups that actually used the materials. So those were the trusted groups, as Bonnie said, the, the local folks with feet on the ground who, ha who have the relationships, they were the ones who used it. And, and the um, video is, some of the, some of the information about federal food stamps program is outdated on the video, but it's been watched like 75,000 times. So I don't know what that means, but, um, but it's been used by a lot of different groups. And so I think those are the kinds of things give me, can be useful. And, um, you know, it's a kind of format that's a little bit more engaging. Um, but yes, but expanding our bandwidth in Spanish language um, materials would be fantastic. Yeah, um, obviously our work is different, <laughs> right? Obviously our work is different, but I mean, yeah, um, that's it's the same methods um, that we use different different languages. Uh, we also try to provide workshops or trainings at times that are convenient for for them. 
not at times that are convenient for us. Um, we um, use the infographics as Bonnie was saying. Um, and um, yeah, I know in my previous work at the YWCA, um, we would work with, with um, Lideres Campesinas and I know they would go out and, and you know, like, like Christy said, it's getting the information out. Uh, that's the hard thing. And, and they would go out, I think at like 4 a.m. and put information on the porta potties because that's where people would read them. Well, not read them, but see them. Um, so they had to go out and, and do that before the before they pulled those um, those bathrooms out. Um, but yeah, leave it. Um, Radio Bilingua is great. Um, and then also, you know, when it's complicated, just trying to partner with with um, your local nonprofits because they might already, you know, they're already engaged in this type of work because they're already going to have obviously some inroads there with with people. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Evan asking, have there been any attempts to replicate ALBA elsewhere in the state? Um, by bias, no, <laughs> but not by ALBA itself. We can't unfortunately do that. Um, but um, there are other, there's um, alumni um, that are trying to replicate uh, an ALBA-like program um, in Ellensworth, um, I know we've also done trainings for other, other um, land-based programs like Center for Land-Based Learning. Um, and, you know, right now there's a lot of discussion from different, you know, there's some partners, but also um, um, some other um, ag businesses and other businesses I, that we've been talking to. I, I won't disclose our names now until we get a little bit closer, hopefully. But um, talking about... Um, running uh, maybe not exactly incubator like programs um but you know some aspects of it of them and um you know acquiring land and and making it accessible to to farmers um that are leaving our program or latino just latino farmers um and um you know trying to eventually um transfer some of that wealth and um and ownership over to them um and, and yeah we 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 would be happy to participate more in an advisory type role, but yeah, it's hard. We do get a lot of requests. I, I know we talked to a different group the other day and they're, they're just saying, yeah, I mean, would it be possible for you guys to do this for us? And um, yeah, unfortunately we only have what, 10, 11 staff members. <laughs> so we can't, we can't exactly do that. And, um, but yeah, we definitely can, can advise on that and have advice on that. Okay. Um... We have a question about um, farm workers' aspirations to be farm owners. Um, the question is, how are we to assess whether that is their aspiration? And I'm curious if we should also assess how we can be facilitators of achieving those aspirations and other aspirations. That's a Patricia question. Oh, I thought you were in the, I saw you move. I thought you were going to say something. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we don't, I mean, people that are coming to our program are, 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 are coming to us are coming because they have aspirations already to, to become farm owners or, you know, they want to learn more. Um, so um, I guess the way that we, that we try to determine, determine whether they'll be able to, to, um, to become farm owners, uh, besides the, the requirements of the course, right? I mean, there are requirements. They have to um, go through and complete all of the modules, at least 80% of the modules. They have to do the homework. They have to do the field work. Um, and the homework, yeah, there is documentation and 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 it's tough. And, and primarily that's because there's going to be a lot of documentation needed uh, when, when they start farming. There's so many regulations and they're going to have to um, do that. So it's going to be they're not getting their homework in. That's a pretty strong indicator that they're going to be reluctant to, to kind of follow those or to be in compliance with those regulations um, down the line. Um, but um, really, I mean, um, we just try to see um, where they're at. And unfortunately, they do. What they do have to put a little bit of investment. I would say about two thousand dollars or so to get their farm started. So uh, we work primarily with limited resource. Um, um, uh, 
uh, groups, but um, but you know it, it can't be extremely limited because there will be some investment. Though though we do try to work with like CCOF to get those beginning former scholarships and such. Um, but um, yeah, I mean we're just we're just there to try to evaluate um, how they're doing if they're able to produce if they're going to have like for those that are growing if they have sufficient labor if they have markets so if they have marketing plans and obviously um, you know there's a lot that goes into that but yeah we're not um, yeah I, I mean they're coming with us with they're coming to us with this vision of, of becoming farm workers and you know again some of them might leave and just gain those skills and go back into the labor force um, but you know they do end up um, picking up these additional skills that they didn't have before entering the program and and um, we do, we have done some surveys and, and um, we, we have data on how their, um, how their income has improved after taking the program, um, which I could share uh, with the group uh, as well. And um, yeah, I mean, um, and we do try just depending on, on what is going on, you know, they might mention something else and we might uh, refer them out to different organizations to get help in other areas. Do you, does anyone else want to expand on that or should I move on to another question? Okay, we're good. Um, actually, it's, it is getting close to three o'clock. So um, what I'm going to have our program support unit do is add our feedback survey to the chat, um, just so you have that link um, before, before the webinar is over. Um, and before we continue with uh, maybe one more question, um, I want to pass this back to Sonia. She's going to talk a little bit more about the upcoming webinars for the Racial Equity and Extension webinar series. Sonia, do you want to take the mic for a minute? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I just want to press again upon you to please do fill out the very short feedback survey. We really do need those and we do use them. Um, and I think that link will be put in the chat. Um, so uh, next week we have um, the on Friday, same time, 1.30 to 3, we'll be having the second webinar in the series on serving farmers of color. So um, I think there'll also be a link in the chat for registering for that if you haven't done so already and are interested. Um, and then we'll be taking a little summer hiatus and then in around September and October, we'll be bringing on four more webinars uh, two of them will be focused on issues around knowledge in, of sustainable agriculture and decolonizing our knowledge base. And then another two will be focused on land access issues for farmers of color or people who want to farm. And that was brought up as one of the big challenges earlier by the panelists. So I'm glad we'll, we'll try to bring on some more panelists to address that as best we can. Um, so please stay tuned for announcements on those coming down the line, but yeah, there'll be a little summer break, but thank you very much. All right. Um, so we do have a question that was submitted via a registration form, and I don't know if it's been covered yet, so I'm gonna ask it. Uh, the question is, are there any resources for small scale growers dealing with H2A program difficulties and the issues going into labor shortages here in California? And I can add that to the chat so it's a little bit more visible as well. Um, I, I just wanted to say one thing about the, um, the labor shortages, you know, I mean, um, I don't know what role you UC Cooperative Extension can play, but um, I think that a lot of the labor shortages are caused by uh, fear on the part of farm workers. And, um, you know, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, this is a really vulnerable community. And um, so this shortages, uh, the labor shortages are, um, you know, due to larger economic and political factors that are happening that the rest of us are not really, you know, don't have any power to change or, or, or make much of an impact there. Um, 
but I, I did want it. And so I'm sorry if somebody else had something else to say about that question, please go right ahead. But I did want to uh, I have my hand raised here because before we close, I wanted to make a couple of uh, a points. So uh, specific to that question, maybe Patricia or Christy, you have something else to add? Um, I don't know if anyone in particular. I have some resources that I might be able to point you to that might be able to point you to the right resources. There's um, a, a, a new sort of farm labor contractor in California, it's a nonprofit called Cierto, Cierto Global, that's focused on um, implementing H2A, um, bringing in H2A workers in the most sort of transparent and um, accountable way possible, adhering to all of the right regulations and conditions. So they, they that might be a good right resource. But anyway, I can, um, if you just email me, I will, um, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, somebody earlier asked a question, I don't know if we got to it, about um, policy. And so I just wanted to quickly share with you um, some of the key findings that we found in the, in the COFS study on farm workers during the pandemic, um, loss of, of work and income, um, hardships to pay for basic needs like food, rent, utilities, um, healthcare barriers, et cetera. But we started it off with um, some very um, articulated um, policy recommendations. Um, that are listed here, um, expand and simplify access to income safety net resources. We found many farm workers were excluded from the safety net uh, programs. Um, language barriers were a big problem. Healthcare access and coverage um, was also an, a big issue. So we have here some um, important um, policy recommendations, but there really are, I can see the role of U UC Cooperative Extension um, you know, really important, be able to play a really important role in areas of food, housing, labor, and other even more specific things like um, heat stress. You know, it would be really great to have educational materials that are culturally and linguistically appropriate um, for farm workers regarding heat stress and how to deal with that. How, how do you deal with that in the field? or um, food as well. Uh, when I was working in Madeira, I worked with Martha Lopez from the Cooperative Extension and she created a whole, what she called a Latino food pyramid. And uh, it was really amazing because she was looking at the traditional um, diet of, uh, of Mexicano workers in particular and how healthy that diet is and um, how difficult it is for migrant farm workers to maintain a healthy diet due to, um, you know, a food desert where, you know, you're out there and all you have is a convenience store. Um, all you have, you don't have access to some of these things. So I would really love to see Cooperative Extension uh, begin to play educational roles in these areas of, um, you know, uh, food um, and food safety, food security, um, housing, labor, and then the, um, the kinds of uh, difficulties that farm workers and dangers that farm workers face in the field, like heat and heat exposure, exposure to chemicals, and exposure to smog, you know, and, and, and air quality. Yeah, and I just want to follow up on this and say there have been a number of programs, and probably our greatest strength in cooperative extension are our nutrition, family, and consumer science advisors who do work with a lot of farm workers. Right. We haven't done as much work on the production side of labor issues, but we did have quite a robust heat stress um, outreach program developed by house, uh, a retired cooperative extension specialist. And it would be great if someone could continue on with that work. So um, there's a long way to go for sure. <clears throat> okay, Patricia, do you wanna add anything to that or? Okay. Um, so I, I can't um, tell if you're about to unmute, but I, um, the, it's about three o'clock now, um, unless there are any other remarks that want to be stated before we close out. Um, I just want to restate, please do fill out the feedback survey. Um, I do want to thank all of our panelists and, um, and all of our attendees for being here Obviously there were a lot of questions, so there's a great need for this knowledge. And so we greatly appreciate your time and energy. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, and it, before we close out, feel free, if you wanna say anything else, uh, feel free. Thank you so much for inviting me to be able to share and come full circle back to UC Cooperative Extension. I really admire what you guys do. And thank you so much for organizing both of you. And thank you to my co-panelists for a great conversation. Yes, thank you all, it's been great. Okay. Yes, I want to thank you for your candid comments. I think that's a, the best way we can do to move forward on these issues. So thank you, it was very engaging. All right, have a great day, everyone.